Good morning. Good morning. Welcome on this beautiful, gorgeous day to worship. I want to invite you all to come. Let's be gathered in and let us worship. Wasn't that beautiful? If memory serves, that's from the Civil War era, um, and it's a piece of Americana. And I'm sitting here listening to this, seeing the American flag in the background, and thinking of the Civil War, and thinking of the fight for unity. So think of that today when you read the news, and we gather here today in prayer. Would you rise and join me in the call to worship? Like a flower opening to the light, like a, like a thirst, thirst for water, water on a hot day. We come to worship, like, like a, a wound aching, aching to be healed. healed, like a crying child yearning to be held. We come, come to, to worship, worship, like a prayer longing to reach heaven's gate, like, like a, a note, note waiting, waiting to be sung. sung. We gather for prayer and praise. We come, come to, to worship, worship, to be filled, filled with hope, set, set free by love, love and dedicate our lives to God's grace and peace. Please remain standing and let us join in hymn number 158, Come Christians Join to Sing.
remain standing as we join together in the opening prayer. O oh God, may our faith be a little more daring, our words a little louder for justice, our hopes a little more ambitious for your kingdom, our thoughts a little more global for our world, our actions a little more local for our community, our living a little more trusting of your reign, our loving a little broader for the gospel, our vision a little more challenging for your sake, and in our little steps recognize the transformation you make possible when we live out your expansive, open, and free, unlimited love a little more day by day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. All right, I want to invite up our kids. You may be seated. I want to invite up our kids. A little, come on, Torsten. <laughs> I said we don't often have a Oh, and Jimmy and Charlie. There they are. Come on, Jimmy, Charlie, Torsten. Come on up. All right. So we, so we're going to do a little game here today. So I got a box. And it's got a little surprise in it. But here's how we're going to play. <laughs> So I'm going to put this on the altar. So here's the thing. You guys, come with me on the carpet. Come on, stand up. Come over here. So here's how we're going to work it. You can have what's ever in that box, but you cannot, under any circumstances, step on the wood. All right? So you see the box? It's right there. See the box? See it, Charlie? You can have whatever surprise is in here, but you can't step on the wood. All right. Now I want you to come get your prize. Ready? Set, go. <laughs> do, do. <laughs> so what's the problem? What's the problem? You have to step on the wood. Well, my goodness, what are we going to do? Well, what if I did this? So what if I did you? So I pick him up. Here we go. Can you get it? Can you pick some? Whoa, look at that. <laughs> All right. Did he step on the wood? No. What, what got him there? What's getting him there? <laughs> Is it me? Here, you got some. There you go. <laughs> now, Charlie's a little bigger. So, <laughs> he's a big guy. There's a little stuff. Oh, and he's got a frisbee. All right. So, the way you got there was I lifted you, right? It was my strength that took you so that you could get this gift. You know what we call this? This is a, a word that means a lot of things, but it's a word called grace. You know what grace is? It's a free gift that we don't get on our own, but we get it by the strength of God. Because you know who's lifting us up to get that? Now, I lifted you up, but you know who lifts us up in life? Jesus does. That's right. So... You can get a different prize if you want because there's frisbees, there's little planes, and all these things relate to being free because that's what grace does. It sets us free. So let's say a prayer. Dear God, thank you so much for your grace. Thank you for how it frees us and liberates us. Thank you for these young disciples. Thank you for your grace active in their lives. Be with them, watch over them each and every day. Amen. All right, as you guys head back, I'll we'll invite everybody to stand. Let's share the peace of Christ with each other. All right. You want a little frisbee? <laughs> there you go.
Thank you. Another beautiful piece this morning. The Old Testament reading this morning is from Exodus chapter 3, verses 7 through 12. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land and into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Amen. Thank you. Our gospel lesson this morning is from John's gospel. It's there in your bulletin. I invite you to stand for the reading of our gospel lesson. Hear these words from John's gospel. After this, there was a festival of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now in Jerusalem, by the Sheep Gate, there is a pool called in Hebrew Bethesda, which has five porticos. In these lay many invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there had been ill for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had been there a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me in the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I am making my way, someone else steps down ahead of me. Jesus said to him, Stand up, take your mat, and walk. May God add a blessing to our hearing and living out of the word this day. You may be seated. During uh, children's time at a local church, the kids were called forward to hear the message of that day, which was about being thankful for all the blessings that God had given them. And at the end, they were asked a question, what are you thankful for? And one answered, my family, and another said, my home, and another said, friends. And then little Joy piped up, and he says, I'm free. The leader of the children's time marveled that this little boy would be able to conceptualize this idea of freedom and what it means. And so he went on and on to talk about freedom, how great it was that this little boy could, could talk about freedom on this day. And he ended by saying, I'm so proud of you, Joy, for being so thankful that you are free. It was then that, they, that the person leading the children's time finally noticed in the congregation, everybody was pointing behind them to the little boy who had a huge smile on his face and was holding up three fingers, saying, I'm free. <laughs> I'm free. Well, today we are going to talk about being free, not three, but actually free, as we talk about freedom as we continue to look at Moses, focusing on how his story in Exodus speaks to our story today. We've already seen Moses' early life, how he was saved by those who let their faith push back their fear. We then saw Moses at the burning bush being called by God at the age of 80 to a greater work and a purpose in his life. And we focused on the question, are we listening today for how God is calling us? No matter our age, no matter our circumstances, are we listening for how, to, how God is calling us and leading us to a greater work and a greater purpose in our world? And so today in our reading, we hear about this greater work that Moses is being called to do. We heard it read, then the Lord said, I've observed, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I've come down to deliver them. I am sending you go. We've seen a common theme in Exodus, that when God works in our world, it is through people. By calling and sending people to be hearts and hands participating in his work of encouraging blessing and challenging, liberating and healing the world. So Moses is sent forward to bring freedom to his people. He goes with his brother Aaron, and he goes to see Pharaoh, and he says those famous words, let my people go, 
and Pharaoh responds with irritation. Who is this Lord that I should heed him and let Israel go? I do not know this Lord, and I will not let them go. Pharaoh then goes on to enact a punishment on the people as he orders them to make the same quantity of bricks, but with no straw. It is a harsh punishment. It's a brutal punishment. It resulted in the people needing to go out to the fields and literally get on their hands and knees, picking up every scrap of straw that they can make the same quantity of bricks. And the people are angry. They come to Moses, their, their supposed liberator in their minds. They're angry. They're upset at his actions that have hurt them so much. There's a great lesson here about freedom. Sometimes when we do the right thing, things may get worse before they get better. Once there was a man who was an alcoholic for a long time. He was destroying his health, he was destroying his life. His best friend said to him, come with me. I'm, I'm tired of seeing you suffer. I, I want to see you better. Come, just come with me. Come to this AA meeting that's at the church. Just come. So the man went, <clears throat> and he listened. And in time, through those, he, he gave up drinking. He got involved in the church community with his friend. He put his life on the path of being a disciple of Christ. A couple, couple of months later, you know, three, four months later, he comes to his friend. He's incredibly depressed. He says, I thought I was doing the right thing. I gave up drinking. I got my life together. I accepted Jesus. But now my life today is far worse than it ever was when I was drinking. I feel horrible all the time. And now my wife just told me this morning that she's leaving me. And she said to me, I liked you better when you were drinking. And so she walked out on me. So now I feel horrible and I'm all alone. So the friend urged him, begged him, pleaded with him, just be patient, just trust to not leave the path that leads to life instead of the path that he had been on that was taking life away. So he held his course, as hard and as painful as it was. Well, the friend moved away. Three years later, they met again. They reconnected. And this man comes, and he says that after a lot of struggle, he says, you know what? I'm so glad you put me on this path because I am happier than I've ever been at any time in my life. I'm happily remarried. I'm now a sponsor and a leader in AA and in the, the church. I'm helping others find freedom, knowing that it never comes easy. Knowing that sometimes when we do the right thing, you take a risk, you tell the truth, you make a change, things may get worse before they get better. But the lesson we need to hear this day is to be patient, to trust, to have faith and stay on the path that leads to life, life abundantly. This is what Moses was committed to doing. It's not like he had one audience with Pharaoh. Pharaoh said no, and he said, oh, all right, did my best. He kept going back. Even in the face of Pharaoh's stubbornness, the people's anger, and the people's disappointment, he kept returning. Moses continued to see Pharaoh making his demands for the release of the people, and Pharaoh continued to refuse. The scripture says his heart was hardened. In fact, it says it over a dozen times that Pharaoh's heart was hardened. The point of this reference to Pharaoh's heart was that Pharaoh's choices to harden his heart had an impact on his life. It was binding him up, it was imprisoning him, putting him on a path leading to destruction. For at the very end, Moses lost his life. For us, this scripture is a signal and a warning for us about making choices that are leading to hardening or closing our hearts. In our scripture in Proverbs 4.23, it says, Above all else, guard your heart, for everything we do flows from it. And in Psalms, we hear, Create in me a pure heart, O God. Renew a steadfast spirit in me. In other words, our hearts were created to be free. And so if today we're holding on to any bitterness or hurts, then we need to forgive. The word that's used for harden here in Exodus is actually a Hebrew word. And the Hebrew word is kabed. And its literal meaning is heavy. So the sense you're to get is Pharaoh's hardening his heart. His heart is getting heavier and heavier and heavier. It's also an ironic twist with Egyptian mythology that in their view of the afterlife, you were judged as unworthy, unjust, sent to the equivalent of an Egyptian hell if your heart got too heavy. 
you wanted the lightest heart possible. So it's an ironic twist that Pharaoh, in his choices, was making his heart heavier and heavier and heavier. But for us, we know that we can make our hearts heavy. We can fill it with all sorts of things, and so we need to practice that spiritual discipline of forgiveness. And so the image we have of forgiveness that I want you to have is if you go out today and you put a backpack on, and as you're walking along, you pick up all the stones that you see. Look, I got this little stone. It's been in my pocket. So you pick up little stones like this, and then you pick up medium stones, and maybe you pick up really heavy stones, and you put them all in that backpack. You just start picking them in the backpack. And you're carrying it. And after a while of doing that, of picking up stone after stone after stone after stone, you will be weighed down so much, you won't be able to move. You'll be so heavy, like we heard in Exodus. To forgive is to drop the backpack filled with all the stones of our hurts, of our regrets, of our pains. It's to let go and it's to put those in a stronger, into stronger hands of God. Is this easy to do? No. But is it necessary? Definitely. I urge us today to begin the process of healing any old wounds, putting things to rest, letting God free us, heal and transform and soften our hearts and our lives. One woman reflected on her journey of forgiveness in this way. She said, yes, my parents were abusive, both verbally and physically. They never bothered to control their tempers. They took out their frustrations on each other and on us children. But I have learned that forgiveness is a great healer. I no longer hold feelings of anger over what happened to me as a child. There's a great deal of freedom in forgiving. I can achieve any goal I wish without the shackles of blame. I have no score to settle with my parents. I don't keep a tally of wrongs done to me by them. I awake every morning and I feel unchained. And the writer concludes, life is so very, very short. Why spend time being chained up to your negative thoughts? They only hurt the person who feels them. I invite us this day to learn the lesson of our heart this day. We were meant to have free hearts, not bound up, not filled with stones of regrets and hurt and bitterness. The result of Pharaoh's choice, the result of him hardening his heart to Moses and the plight and the misery of the Israelites, was what's recorded in Exodus over many chapters, actually Exodus chapter 7 through chapter 11. And it's these, it's the plagues that occur. The plagues were an instrument used to put pressure on Pharaoh to free the Israelite people. Each one got worse and worse, steadily worse. They intensified, and with each one, Pharaoh's heart got heavier and heavier as it hardened more and more, as he just got filled with more anger and that. He continued to choose this path of destruction until the very last plague, the, the worst of it, the death of the firstborn. And this plague was actually... Again, a twist because it was actually chosen by Pharaoh himself. Pharaoh, in the very beginning, when Moses was just a little baby, had ordered a decree to kill every firstborn of Hebrew children. So now, in this ironic twist, Pharaoh's own decree to kill every firstborn of the Hebrew has now circled back. And now, every firstborn of the Egyptian families will now be killed. It was this plague, far worse than the others, that ultimately led to the people's freedom. But more than that, it was this plague that actually formed them into a nation that they would become. God instructed them on this night, on this horrible night, that they were to cut a hyssop branch. They were to sacrifice a lamb, and then they were, put, they were to put that lamb's blood, they were to put it on the branch and swipe it over their doors. In this way, the houses with the blood that had been sprayed over the doorposts would be passed over by death. Further, the people, once they were liberated, were to eat a particular meal to remember this event and celebrate their freedom each year. This meal would become known as the Passover Seder, celebrated by our Jewish cousins around our own celebration of Easter is when it usually falls. But it was this Passover story of Exodus that speaks most, of, most to us about freedom. In 1 Corinthians 5, 7, Jesus is called the Passover lamb. As the blood was used to save and free the people from the bondage of slavery on that night, so too does the blood of Jesus Christ save and free us from the bondage of sins. It's no accident that the writer of John's Gospel, a faithful Jew, wrote that Jesus was the Lamb of God 
who takes away the sins of the world. And just as a hyssop branch was used to smear that blood over those doorposts on that night back in the Exodus, so too at the crucifixion of Jesus was a hyssop branch used again, this time to offer water to Jesus. And most powerfully, it was at the Passover Seder in the upper room where Jesus took the bread and the wine from the table and reinterpreted them to be symbols of freedom found in our sacrament of Holy Communion. For our Jewish cousins, the central saving act of God, the act that freed them as a people was this night, this night of the Passover, when they were finally liberated from slavery and they were claimed as a people and they began their journey to the Promised Land. But I want you to hear this morning that this story of Exodus is a big story. It spans and stretches across time, connecting and continuing to speak to us this day. For the same God that was at work in the lives is continuing to bring about our freedom. For us as disciples of Christ, God's central saving act, the act that led to not just for a particular people, but to all of humanity's ultimate freedom from sin and pain, freedom from death and despair, freedom from hopelessness and regret that claims us as a people, sets us on a path and a journey of faith and life, is the life and the ministry and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In our gospel lesson, we hear of Jesus healing a man by the pool of Bethesda. He comes to set this man free, is what he's doing. That whole gospel lesson that, I, that you heard read was about freedom, being set free from his, from his affliction to experience a whole new life. In fact, if you read the gospels, what you find is that Jesus does one thing over and over and over again. He frees people. He frees their bodies as he heals them. He frees their minds as he teaches them. Again and again, Jesus frees us and delivers us. The central point in the lesson is this. The story of freedom is central to how God is at work in our lives and our world, even to this day. And so we need to remember that even when we do the right thing to take that step forward, to take that risk, to change a habit, to stretch ourselves and grow, we're going to need to be patient and trust in those times when it doesn't go well. For we are not alone and a greater strength is with us. We need to think about our hearts, seriously think about our hearts today. And we need to regularly practice the spiritual discipline of forgiveness. We need to think of those rocks that we put in there. And are we willing to let them go? We need to free ourselves from everything that's pulling us down, pulling us off that path that's leading us to nowhere. And most importantly, we need to know this day that whatever is binding us, whatever is constraining us or limiting us in some way from living life to its absolute fullest, whether it's fear or resentment, anger or grief, judgment or jealousy, bitterness or regret, we need to know that there's a way to freedom. This powerful story says to us that God cares. God hears. God sees our hurts and is with us, and we don't have to remain en enslaved. If this day, this morning, you are feeling constrained and the walls are closing in and you're feeling enslaved by something, you need to know this day that freedom is there for you. All we need to do is follow that path that leads to life. That's what Jesus has given us through the cross. For the Israelites were saved and freed and delivered not through their own work. The Israelites didn't do anything to earn their freedom. They didn't work at all toward it. They did nothing to deliver themselves. It was a pure gift from God. It was an act of God's kindness and mercy and love, and that's what we call grace, which is what you see throughout this powerful story of Exodus, God's amazing, freeing grace, because that's what grace does. It frees us. And that grace and that freedom is freely offered to us this morning right now for the taking. All we need to do is have open hearts to accept it. Amen. Let's stand and let's respond as we sing of grace, as we sing hymn 2162 in the faith we sing, Grace Alone.
Amen. You may be seated. So let's turn to our time of prayer as a community. Our ushers are going to come give you a microphone so we can hear one another. Those that we're recording the service for can hear us. So I invite you to lift up the joys you have this day, the concerns that you have. What are your prayers this morning? Who are you praying for? Who's on your heart this morning that you're praying for? Sure. Yeah. Just prayers for my oldest sister, Amy. Many of you know that she's been in a nursing home with MS and a stroke for about seven or eight years. Um, she's had a big setback, and my nephew and his family have decided to put her on palliative care. Uh, so we don't quite know what her future is, but prayers for Amy and her family. All right. All right. Other prayers this morning? Yeah, down here with Eileen. Morning. Uh, a joy and a concern. My niece had uh, her fourth little boy uh, August 2nd, and uh, we were very happy, but he was born with a congenital heart defect, and so he's had um, some heart surgery. And so just prayers for the family, my sister, my niece, and healing for little Grayson. All right. We pray for him. I'm going to lift up a couple of prayers of joy. Oh, here, let Maxine. Didn't see your hand there, sorry. Uh, a prayer of joy and thanks for living in a, an area that is peaceful and beautiful, and we can all do what we want to do. Yeah. What a great place to live. <laughs> all right, amen. <laughs> I want to lift up a prayer of joy. Marsha Peterson is here, she, a good, dear friend of our congregation. And yes. so she's visiting back again. So it's great to see you, Marsha. And uh, Amy, our, one of our newest members, um, is back there. And five weeks ago, she delivered her little boy, Connor, who she, oh, uh, she is holding. So greet both of them. It's great to see them here this day. Other joys or other concerns or other prayers that you have? I morning? have a prayer of concern for the young woman and her child who are 
in Family Promise shelter care this week. Um, we pray that we can help her get into a more stable situation. And prayers of joy for Family Promise in, in the number of families that they've been able to divert from shelter care. Okay. <clears throat> we should also remember those in uh, Virginia, those victims of what had happened there, and pray for those families, and especially those that lost their lives. Ed, down here. Come in, Ed. <laughs> Good morning. I would ask for continuing prayers for our ministry in sunlight. Um, we've made it through the summer, but August is a tough month right now. Uh, we had Joel Geyer, uh, who left us, to journey around the world with his wife, who's a nurse, so we wished him well. And, of course, Kathy Nelson retired, and Marie uh, has jumped right in and is working well. But we're still down one and a half people, and maybe if we're lucky, we could make it two full-time people. So I just ask that all of us continue to pray that we can uh, fulfill that staffing need and keep the ministry uh, at the level we'd like to see it at. Thank you. All right. Continued prayers for sunlight. Other prayers this morning? Well, I do invite you on our prayer chain, on our bulletin, to keep all these names, all these people, all these situations in your thoughts and your prayers for healing and for strength and for peace. Those in our hearts at home, all these names for our hearts at home, just keep those in your prayers and those serving our nation. At the beginning of the service, you got a card and um, to keep track of that you're here today, I invite you to fill that out. But I also invite you to fill that out if you do have a prayer and you want to be part of our prayer chain. Fill that out, put it in the offering plate when it comes by. We do take it seriously. We want to pray with you and we want to pray for you. So fill that out and be a part of our family of prayer. Well, with these prayers you've named, those that are unnamed, let's pause. Let's pray. Oh God, we give thanks for this morning to come to be gathered together here to worship you, to give praise and to give thanks, to come this day and, and to celebrate freedom and to celebrate grace. We know, God, that you are continuing to work in our lives to bring about freedom in whatever way that we need. Help us, O oh Lord, to have the patience and the trust and the faith. Help us to continually unload and unburden ourselves and our hearts this morning. Give us the strength. Let us feel your presence that's right alongside us. Free us, O oh Lord, that we may have open eyes and open hearts, the freedom to truly see those who are struggling around us, as we this day pray for those outside these walls. We pray for those who are struggling with freedom, maybe freedom from illness or injury, and we pray for those who are in hospital, in nursing homes, assisted living centers, those who are recovering from surgery or operations, and we pray for your healing presence. We pray, O oh Lord, for those who are in the, in the midst of grief, whether it is long ago um, or it was just recent, but yet that hole in their heart is still there, O oh God. We pray for your comfort and your peace to fill that hole. We pray, O oh Lord, for those who are struggling in our community, those held in the bondage of poverty or of oppression, homelessness, despair, depression, addiction. And we pray, O oh Lord, for those who hear your call, who hear the call to be sent forth to bring freedom and liberation and are working with them. Let us have open eyes and hearts, O oh God, to join in that work, in that ministry, in that greater purpose around us. We pray, O oh Lord, for our world around us and for those in the midst of injustice and oppression. And We pray for peace, O oh Lord, to reign in our hearts, strength to be with those who are working to bring about your kingdom in our midst. Oh, Lord, we also gather this day, and we, we gather with open eyes and hearts, and we pray for open hearts that we may see the many blessings, the many blessings that do lighten our hearts, lighten our souls and our spirits, fill us with life and with joy as we look upon our blessings of our families, our friends, those that journey with us, the celebrations and the the celebrations that we have in life of birthdays, of anniversaries, our church family that prays for us, your son Jesus Christ, whose whole ministry, whose whole life and death and resurrection 
It was about grace and it was about freedom. And so, Lord, we celebrate that this day as we open our hearts wide to accept that gift. Oh, Lord, we come with these prayers, but there are others on our hearts, so we pause for a moment just to let your Holy Spirit nudge us as we come to take this time to listen to where you may be leading or calling us in this time of silent prayer. Oh, Lord, as you've heard our prayers, silent and spoken, hear us now as we join with one voice, one heart as we pray together this morning. Our Father, few announcements. Don't want you to forget about Tai Chi going on Mondays and Fridays here at the church uh, with Jackie. And uh, on really good days, you'll be outside. So come for this exercise and relaxation. So you heard Connie talk about Family Promise. Last week when we had this announcement, it was about come be on call because there was nobody in the program. Well, things change week by week, and this week it did. And so we uh, into the program came Nikita and her daughter Avery. So no longer are we asking for you to be on call, now we actually need help. Now we actually need help in this ministry to reach out to this woman who is homeless with her young daughter. And so out there in the narthex is a board, and on it are some ways that you can help. We need help setting up and taking down on our Sunday that we're doing this, on the um, 27th and then the 3rd, and then we need people to do food and people who would want to stay overnight at the church. So all you got to do is sign your name up and then check the boxes of the days you're available. So I invite you to think about helping out um, to be here with, uh, with Nikita and Avery in this ministry to reach out to them who are homeless. Our meal site's coming up, our fifth Thursday meal site, August 31st. The sign-up sheet is down by the main door. So I invite you to sign up to, bring, to volunteer, bring desserts or fruit. We leave the church at 4.30 on that Thursday. We go down to St. Vincent. DePaul's at All People's Church, and we serve food to the homeless and those in need that are living in that area around Martin Luther King Boulevard. So I invite you to think about that, bringing desserts and fruit, helping out with that ministry. September 10th is coming up, and we got a lot going on on that Sunday. We're going to do a little experiment here. We're going to do early morning and, and uh, coffee and donuts before worship. Um, this is also our rally day, so we're doing celebration and a picnic after worship. And then choir practice starts. So... Come sing. We need you. We need your beautiful voices, so come sing. Tonight is also the last of our parish nurses sponsored walks. We've had tremendous um, response to these walks. We've had so many people come out and go on each of these walks. Well, tonight's our last one. It's sort of the crowning jewel of the walks at Lions Den Gorge Nature Preserve in Grafton. This is the one the parish nurses love the best, recommend the most. So come on out for our final walk. We'll meet at 4 o'clock. There's directions. I didn't want to put them all on the screen, but in your insert are really good directions. There's also an address, I think, there as well. Are there any other announcements? I think I got them all. Irene. Okay. So we have a box out on the narthex for the Hunger Task Force. Um, so if you have non-perishable food items... Bring it here. We empty that box. Yeah, always peanut butter is needed. And so please uh, bring some stuff. We take that down to Hunger Task Force. This month of August is also through our... Oh, Marilyn. Uh-huh. 
That's right. The mosquito, the baby's there. <laughs> and then go help protect the baby with the mosquitoes. Take the mosquito, make a donation. And you have an insert in here about it. And each Sunday, we're going to watch a little snippet of someone struggling, needing a little freedom from malaria. So tonight, or today, this morning, we meet um, Jennifer. Well, I'm Jennifer, and I am a wife and mom of four kiddos. And I live in the suburbs of St. Louis, Missouri. And I'm just like everybody else and loving on my kids and being a stay-at-home mom. And in 2005, I had an experience that uh, just rocked my world and was completely unexpected. I was four months pregnant with our fourth child and I became very, very sick. And on my second trip to the emergency room, um, just in trying to figure out what in the world was wrong with me, my fever was getting close to 104 degrees and we couldn't uh, come up with anything that was causing that. And I finally happened to just mention to the doctor that I had been in Central America on a mission trip about nine months prior. And it was like the light bulb went off in the doctor's eyes. And he said, were you bitten by any mosquitoes while you were there? And I knew instantly that I was lying there in a hospital in the middle of the United States of America, pregnant with malaria. I spent about a week in the hospital and had an excellent team of doctors, and great medication that was readily available, and came home to recover. And during that time, I knew that I wanted to learn everything that I could about malaria. What is this disease? And what is this medication that I'm taking? And how does it affect my baby? And what is this reality that throughout the world people have to, to deal with on a daily basis? And the information that I learned was absolutely devastating that this curable disease was claiming so many lives throughout the world. And here I am in the United States of America dealing with malaria while I'm pregnant. My baby boy was born perfectly healthy, right on time. And we named him Jacob because I had wrestled with God. And as I held him in my arms in that hospital room, I couldn't help but think of the 3,000 mothers that were holding their babies that day as they died of malaria, simply because they live on the other side of the ocean. And I wasn't okay with that. As I watched Jacob grow, I knew that I couldn't get those moms out of my head and I had to do something. So I just did what I knew to do. I began with social networking and building relationships with friends from church and even partnered with a recording artist so that I could do whatever I could to inspire others to join this fight against malaria. In 2012, I was approached by Imagine No Malaria and needless to say, I was elated at the opportunity to join forces with such an extraordinary effort against this disease. And the good news is, is that we're making progress. It's no longer 3,000 moms every day. The number continues to decline. And I love it that now I'm able to point people so easily to imaginomalaria.org so that they can find out ways that they can be involved and that they can join this fight against malaria. All right, if you would like to help people find freedom from malaria, I invite you to give this day. I want to invite us with open hands and hearts to give of our blessings that we've been given this day. I want to invite our ushers forward to collect our morning offering and another uh, wondrous gift of music for us.
Let's pray. Oh God, we give thanks for the tremendous blessings that we have in our life as we this day, out of freedom and out of joy and out of love, give back to you. We pray your blessing on all that we have given, on our hands and our hearts, on all that we give to you this day, that you may use them so that we may be sent forth as your people of your grace, your hope, and your freedom in Christ's name. Amen. Let's join in our closing hymn, Freely, Freely, hymn 389. Through Jesus' amazing grace, we've been set free to live, to serve, to love, to care. Let us go forth this day as servants and vessels ready to freely give and pour out hope and joy and peace to our world. As we close our service by singing together, go in the peace of God.